Almighty God, we thank you now for, for your grace. So many times we have neglected to lift our hearts and thank you. So many times we have forsaken one of the fundamental virtues of the Christian life, gratitude. And so many times we resort to complaining because things aren't going our way. Forgive us now, Lord, and may you bless your words unto our hearts and magnify yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, God's people say, Amen. 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 We have been on this series, we have called it The Road to the Promised Land. And then this is the final installment of that series. We've been on a journey together, amen? amen? On the first installment, it had to begin with God letting a people go. There's no reason we could contemplate entering the promised land unless we have been released from the bondage and the captivity that was and that is for many of us still our reality. And so God sent Moses and his brother Aaron to tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. You have no business holding on to my people. I have heard their cries and let them go or else you have to answer to me, almighty God. You think you're big, but I'm bigger. Let my people go. I am who I am. In the second installment, we see the people on the journey to the promised land. And now they had to conform to the rules of the road, so to speak. You can't be on this road to the promised land and do your own thing. That does not work. That is not God's will. That is not what God wants if we are to enter the promised land. And so we talked about obeying the rules. We talked about those of us who are so stubborn and so stiff-necked that we want to go our own way and create problems for others. And we had a, a ball talking about road rage and how that comes about because of selfishness oftentimes and because of us thinking that we're entitled. We're entitled to be on the road as if this promised land was only for us. Last week we gathered ourselves and we understood that sometimes when you're on the road to the promised land, you're tempted to turn back. You're tempted to turn back, especially when you hear bad report ahead. Especially when you hear that there are giants in the land, the good land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Especially when you hear that there might be some difficult times ahead, even though we're moving to the promised land. Many of us do not want to endure that frustration or that inconvenience, and so we're tempted to turn back. And many of us in this room, many of us listening in from home, you know you've been there. You know you're on the road to something good, the land flowing with milk and honey. But because of the difficulties in your way, because sometimes it's hard to understand. Now, why, why would God put some difficulty in my way when I need to go to the promised land? Well, have you thought that maybe God wants us to check ourselves? Before we wreck ourselves. 
Have we understood that sometimes and because we're on the road to the promised land, we're going to have some difficulties? Who told you? Who told us that on the road to the promised land, there will be no problems? And so we're tempted to turn back. Remember what the people said. Lord, <laughs> why have you brought us out here to die? Really? Seriously? You want to ask God that question when that God was the same God who heard your cries? The same God who sent Moses and Aaron to the Pharaoh? The same God who gave you rules to love your neighbor and love your God? Is it that same God who brought you on the road to die? Is that your best excuse? And so today, <laughs> in the formation of this glorious experience, now we have arrived. Now the people of Israel has arrived. They want to be there and they got there. Congratulations, folks. We have made it. We have made it. The journey is now ended for many of us. The accomplishment that we sought has been realized. The degree, the schooling, the education, the job, the, the, the relationship, the marriage, the house, the picket fence, everything you have now established and achieved. Now what? Now we say thank you. Now we say thank you. You know, my friends, sometimes we have to approach things with a little perspective. You've heard of the man who started complaining he had no shoes. And then later on realized that there was another man who did not have any leg. The spouse who complains when dinner is not on time should be grateful because he, she is home with that spouse and not with somebody else, if you know what I mean. A little perspective. The teenager who is constantly complaining about having to do the dishes should be grateful because that means that he or she is at home and not on the streets. Be grateful. Have a little perspective. I should be grateful for the fact that I pay taxes. Yes, I pay taxes. Why? Because it means I have a job. I should be grateful for the fact that my clothes kind of fit a little tight. Uh, it, back, back here, I got to adjust every now and then. Why? Because I have some clothes to wear. It takes a little perspective to be grateful. Amen? I should be grateful for the lawn that is needing mowing and, and the windows that need cleaning and the gutters that we need to fix because it means I have a home. I should be grateful for the parking space I find at the far end. Oh my God, the other day I went to Walmart. And I had to park way over there. And, you know, I started mm, grumbling. Then I realized that, hey, thank God, thank God, thank God I'm capable of walking. It takes a little perspective, amen? Come on, church, talk to me. It takes a little perspective. When we're tempted to complain, when we're tempted to not realize that the promised land is right here, now we're there. Oh, my God, it looks so good. But, 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 I got to complain about something. It takes a little perspective. I should be grateful, shouldn't I, for the person behind me in church who sings off-key because it means I can hear. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. We need to adopt this attitude of gratitude, y'all. We need to understand that it is okay. It is okay for the problems to, con uh, to confound us and the, and the problems to rush us and the problems to push us away and the problems to harass us and molest us. It's okay because at least we know we're alive. We woke up this morning in our right minds. I don't see no crazy people in front of me. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. 
Gratitude is that attitude that we need to have. Now that we're in the promised land, now that we can say, hip hop hooray, we're there. Now we can say that, look, God, you have been gracious. You have been great, gracious to us. And I have to put this in perspective. Gratitude is a thankful appreciation for what an individual receives, whether that is tangible or intangible. I'm grateful to God for my wife, for my family. I'm grateful to God for y'all's love. I'm grateful to God. Now, some of us complain, and I complain, and you complain, but you know what? I'm grateful. I love my church. Amen? That is the attitude. Gratitude acknowledges the good in my life, especially what is valuable and meaningful. Because at the end of the day, you all, look at the person sitting next to you or across from you. This is really what matters, that we have another life sitting with us and being with us and sharing with us and understanding our pain, understanding our, our suffering. And in the process, people usually recognize that the source of that goodness lies at least partially outside of myself. I can't be so self-absorbed. I can't be so selfish. I need to understand that the next person nudging me or the next person stepping on my feet, Lord have mercy, is a person I need to regard. The person I need to understand that God's image is also in that person. And so I'm grateful. It takes a little perspective. Oh Lord, may we get that perspective as we enter the promised land. As we enter that promised land. Those who have studied gratitude have found some things. Gratitude is strongly associated with greater happiness. Did you know that? The more grateful you are, the more thankful you really are. I'm not saying you walk up in church skinning your teeth, grinning your teeth, saying thank you, Lord, but you don't mean it inside. I'm talking about real, authentic gratitude. When you're grateful, you're happy. You're content. Oh, yes, there will be storms. Oh, yes, there will be conflict. Oh, yes, there will be contradictions and chaos in your lives. But when you're happy, you have this attitude of happiness and, 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 and gratitude. You have positive emotions, they tell us, and positive thoughts. Think of the people around you who are always negative, always negative. You can't, you can't get a word in edgewise without their telling you something negative. And you wonder if they're happy. You wonder if they're positive. G gratitude relishes good experiences. If I have a good experience with you, it might not be perfect. It might not when I wanted it, how I wanted it, at the time when I wanted it. But, you know, I say thank you, Jesus, because that was an experience that I learned from. Gratitude helps us in our mental and psychological health. A lot of crazy people out there, and I'm not saying this disparagingly. I'm not putting down nobody. There are a lot of crazy folk out there. There are a lot of folk who just can't take it. A lot of folk who just are bombarded by everything, and they think they have to put everything on their shoulders when Jesus says, let me take your load from you. Gratitude helps us build strong relationships. You see a person coming who is grateful. The person is always positive. Now, he or she may have problems, but they're not going to unload it on you. They're not. That's not their style. You build positive relationships. Quickly, my folks, there are three things that I'd like to put to you from the passage that was read so eloquently by Brother Dijon. First of all, when you look at this attitude of gratitude, you need to understand that it is a heart condition. The attitude of gratitude is a heart condition. I like that. It's a hard condition. Verse 1 of, of, of Deuteronomy 26. When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it. Look at number 1, number 2, number 3. Look at what just happened here. You've entered the land. You've taken possession. Now you're settled. 
Where's your heart? Where's your heart? The heart, according to the Bible, is primarily referring to the ruling center of the entire person, the spring of all desires. According to the Bible, the heart is a center not only of the spiritual activity, but of all the operations of your human life. So your thoughts, your emotions, everything is wrapped up in your heart. Now follow the trajectory, follow the verse 1. You've entered, you've taken possession, you've settled. Now where's your heart? Where's your heart? The heart as center of hidden emotional, intellectual, moral activity. Don't you see the trajectory? Are you choosing not to see the trajectory? Where is your heart in piecing together the puzzle? In fact, it's no longer a puzzle because you have entered, you have possessed, and now you're settled. So what's the problem? As they would say on the street, boo. What's the problem, boo? What is going on here? Where's your heart? It is a heart condition. If after you have entered and possessed and settled, then you're still wandering and complaining? You know how important the heart is to God. 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks at the outward appearance but God looks at the heart. We can't fake it with God. The king's heart is unsearchable to humankind, but the Lord searches all hearts to reward all according to their conduct. Jeremiah 17.10 In the time of judgment, God will expose the hidden counsels of the heart. Now, there might be a reality that you've settled and you've possessed and now you're there, but where is your heart? Where is your heart? You are in the promised land. Where is your attitude of gratitude? And Jesus says, it is the heart secrets that are betrayed by the mouth. From your heart, the mouth speaks. And sometimes the reality that we have, folks, is not the reality that we confess. It's not the reality that we profess. It's not the reality that we testify to. We testify to a different reality. We testify to confusion. We testify to chaos. We testify to disappointed, uh, disappointment. Oh, I've been so disappointed with him. Why don't we testify that we have life? And go to him or her and deal with it. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? What decision will you now make after you've entered and possessed and settled? Now it has become intentional. Now it is something for you to intentionally work at. Gratitude knows no boundaries, you all. In everything, in everything, in everything. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything you give thanks because this is the will of God. Gratitude has no boundaries. God is sovereign. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is everywhere. God sees everything. When I was coming up in Sunday school, we used to sing the song, you know, he, uh, uh, watch your eyes, watch your eyes, what they see. Watch your lips, watch your lips, what they say. Watch your feet, watch your feet where they go, for there's a father up above looking down in tender love. Watch yourself, because God knows. God knows what the heart is spewing out. It's going to come out in our words. It's going to come out in our action. So we have now entered the promised land. We have now possessed it. We have now settled in it. Where is the heart? It's a heart condition. This attitude of gratitude. So whenever we are tempted to grumble, Start counting your blessings. Take inventory. Take inventory. And you might want to start with, oh, I have entered. I have possessed. <laughs> now I'm settling in. 
You might want to start there. You might want to give thanks. I might want to give thanks for what I've accomplished and my family. I want to give thanks that, look, when we journeyed from Chicago to Florida, it, it wasn't an easy journey. And we got here and we found folks who were loving and who were willing to work with us and work on behalf of the kingdom of God. Yeah, there were problems. Yeah, there will always be problems, but the sovereign God says gratitude is a heart condition. Secondly, gratitude is a holy commitment. Now watch this. It's a holy commitment. In verse 2, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce. <laughs> so you're in the promised land, really? And now you're producing first fruits. Watch it now. Watch it now. And give it to the priest to lay on the altar. The altar. Gratitude is a holy commitment. We don't get to just get a job and forget about church. We don't get to <clears throat> get married to our high school sweetheart and then forget that there's a God. Verse 4, the priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in, the, in front of the altar to the Lord. Remember, this is what I give to the Lord. I'm in the promised land. Now my, now my crops are, 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 are bountiful. Now what? Now it becomes not only a heart condition, now it is a holy commitment. Now I got to find my linkage with God. Now I got to make sure that I consecrate everything I have now to God. Now I got to make sure that what I own and what I own and what I, what I reap <clears throat> and, the, and the stuff that I have around me, those things go to God because God brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, out of captivity. The priest shall... Take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord. But in order for the priest to take it from you, watch this closely, you got to offer it. You don't get the priest to pull it away from you. You got to come to the altar, any altar. Make an altar in your house. Make an altar in your car. Make an altar at your office. Any altar. You go to the altar and you say, Lord, I consecrate what I have to you. It's a holy commitment. Because it was this same God, this same God who brought you out. And we can say thank you. We can say that we have this attitude of gratitude. I'm going to say something here, controversial. And after this, you might tune me out, but so be it. We, we're going to go there today. We're going to go there. I have always noticed that folks come to church and they christen their children. They christen their children. They, you know, they, 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 they got godparents and parents coming. And we christen the children. 10, 20 years afterwards, you ask yourself, now where are those kids? Where are those kids? Was this a holy commitment? Where are those kids? Now, now I, I'm, not, I'm not blaming parents. I'm not blaming God parents. I'm just saying throughout the life of the child or the grandchild, they should be made aware that if you're not serving the Lord because you have been dedicated to the Lord, then stop it. Stop it. This is nonsense. You can't degrade the holy sanctuary by coming up in the house of God, pretending to dedicate, pretending to consecrate, and then everybody goes their own way, living their own lives the way they want to live it. You all better stop it. It's not right. If you made a holy commitment, if you made it a vow to God, if you consecrated your life to God and you said, Lord, my child is in your hand, make sure you do your best. Now, 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 if you do your best, parent and godparent and grandparents, if you do your best, then, hey, it happens. But you must always, it is your responsibility. You the one offering the priest. Offering the priest. 
your first fruits. It's a holy commitment. The priest took it. The priest put it on the altar. Now we understand that gratitude is a holy commitment. Paul said in Romans 12 verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. In other words, consecrate your lives to God, which is your true and proper worship, your true and proper act of gratitude. Gratitude reflects our view of ourselves before the Almighty God. Holy commitment demands self-denial. It demands that you totally surrender to God. I didn't make this up. I wish I made this up so that I could go against it myself because I'd be the first to go against this. I wish I made this up so that I could say, well, Pastor Paul, you made that up, didn't you? Now you can go against it. It's a holy commitment. Gratitude. When you show gratitude, you're giving. You're giving God you're giving God out of that heart condition. You remember that? It's a heart condition that gives to God, first of all, whatever your first fruits are. And I know the agony that parents and grandparents and godparents feel when the child that they had nurtured didn't get to the spot they want them to get to. That ain't your fault. As long as you've been faithful in doing what you do, Everybody has a will, and I say this to everybody under the sound of my voice. Everybody has a will. Everybody has a decision to make. You can't make it to heaven hitched on grandma's coattail. You got to commit to God yourself. You can't make it to heaven hitched upon your, your grand, uh, godparents' coattails. This is your own commitment, your holy Commitment to God. Thirdly and lastly, gratitude is not only a heart condition. It's not only a holy commitment, but it is also a human con connection. Human connection. Now, pastor, what do you mean by this? Well, you got to go to verses 11 and 12. You got to go through these two verses. Listen to what happened. When you put your basket before the altar, you give it to the priest, the priest puts on the altar, and then your fruits multiply, and then there's, there's this tithing is, is established and everything. Verse 11, then you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you will rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. When, and verse 12 I think is up there, I hope it's up there, when you have finished, amen, when you have finished settling aside, or setting aside rather, a tenth of all your produce, that's the tithe, you will give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be filled or satisfied. Oh my God. Gratitude is also a human connection. Pastor Paul is saying right here and right now, based on my understanding of the scriptures, if you are the type of person who don't want to help somebody out, you'll never be grateful. If you're the type of person who see the vulnerable in society, and you do not lift a hand. In fact, when you see others lifting a hand to help, you complain. If that's you, you're not a grateful person. Gratitude is a human connection. With gratitude, people acknowledge the goodness in their own lives. And in process, you recognize that there are others outside of yourself who also need help. Can I get a witness? 
Can I get an amen? amen? Gratitude is about not just you and God. No, it extends to the human family. Amen? It extends to those who don't have. It extends to the, to the foreigners. It ex oh yeah, the foreigners. It extends to the same people who many of us polit politically are putting down. It extends to them too. If you're listening in on live stream. It, it extends to your neighbor who happens to have a different skin color. It extends to your neighbor who happens to be from a different state. It extends to somebody who is in need and you are on the verge of helping but you have decided for whatever reason, political, social, economic, you are not going to help and yet you say you're a Christian, yet you say you're grateful, yet you give God thanks, yet, yet you raise your hand in church and you praise the Lord and God says I will have none of that. Your righteousness are like filthy rags before me. Get out of my house. As a result of gratitude, we help others. It's a human connection. The fatherless, the orphans, the widows. Notice these are vulnerable people. What about the Levite, Pastor? Well, let me, let me give you something, something on the Levites. This might take us into our conclusion. You see, the Levites were the only tribe who did not get an inheritance. Check it out. Read that up. Google it. The Levites were given cities, but they were not allowed to own properties. That's why they are listed in the category of the vulnerable. Pastor Paul, what you say? Well, I'll break it down some more. The Levites, according to, according to Numbers chapter 18, verse, verse 24. Read that when you get home. The Levites were dependent upon the tithes of the people. You all hear me? They were dependent because God said that I am your inheritance according to the uh, uh, De Deuteronomy 10 and 9. I am your inheritance and you will provide for the Levites through your tithes and through your giving. They're not owning anything. Ooh, Pastor Paul, bring it home now. What this means, my brothers, my sisters, is that and I, you know, those of us who are in clergy, I'm going to just go there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there. I'm going to go there. I know what this means, but I am going to go there. Some people give offerings and tithes based on what the pastor preaches. Pastor, I'm not going to drop an offering today because <laughs> you preached a sermon I didn't like. And that's why a lot of my clergy colleagues, I can tell you some hidden secrets. That's why a lot of my clergy colleagues have side jobs. Because they got to preach the word of God. And so when the Levites, some of whom were priests, depended upon the offering and the tithe and F folks, I'm not being self-serving here. I'm breaking down the word of God. Because you might see the Levites and say, why, why are the Levites in this category? They aren't homeless. They aren't, they aren't fatherless. They didn't lose their husbands. Why are they vulnerable? They're vulnerable because if you don't give, if your gratitude is stale and frowsy, as we say in my home country, if your gratitude is not where it should be, then the Levites are up the river without a paddle. It's a human connection. When you practice, when you practice destructive, hostile discrimination, you are ungrateful. In fact, you are pitiful. And the Lord reminded the people in that same passage, remember Jacob. Jacob was an, was an Aramean. He was a Syrian. When he got to the land back in the day, your forefather, remember? Back in the day when your forefather came to the land, nobody liked him. He was a foreigner. I'm going to say it. Some of you better cut out this thing where you're telling people to go back to where they came from. 
or else we'll have to dig up everybody. Grandparents, everybody. Let's have a mass deportation from these here United States. Starting with your grand and great grand people who are buried respectfully and honorably. Your father, your forefather Jacob came to this land as a Syrian. That's how they saw him. So if you don't understand, Israel, that once you have entered the promised land, you must be good to the foreigners, be good to the strangers, be good to those who are homeless, fatherless, and, and those who are widows, and to the Levites. If you don't understand that, you don't understand the human connection. You don't understand that when you stand in the sanctuary of God to lift your hands to God, you don't understand that it is a human connection. In closing... Some positive tips. I try to practice, so you better hold me accountable too. <laughs> Work gratitude into your daily conversation. You can be right, uh, saying something to somebody and just, just spill it out. You know I thank God for this. Work it in, into your conversation. A lot of people work in curse words. F you this, F you that. We should say, thank you, Jesus. Work it in to our conversation and help kids understand what that means too. Because kids, when they start growing up, especially around junior high, middle school, that, that's where their framing happens. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it starts from way early, but also there are certain points in their lives that they have to know that it's not all about them. Help the kids through this. Find a goodwill project or start one. You can't say, well, pastor, I don't see what I need to do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. If you, think, if you start thinking creatively, if I start thinking creatively, oh, our hands will be filled <laughs> with projects to do. Amen? Let's just be real. Let, let's, can we talk? Let's be real. Encourage generosity. Uh, use, use selfless acts. Insist on thank you notes. Send a note to somebody. Email somebody. You know what? I love you. I don't care if you love me, but I love you. Brother Brad, I love you, man. And thank you. When your presence is here, when you're here, I, I, I feel so good. I feel like I should preach. Some of you missed that one, but that's okay. <laughs> Insist on thank you notes. Practice saying and accepting no for an answer. If somebody said no to you, you say, okay, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God has this one. Be patient. I close with this. Be patient. You can't expect gratitude to develop overnight. Because some people grew up from, yeah, never having say thank you. They're grown people. I was going to in, in, in include an adjective right there, but I'll leave it alone. They're grown people. Be patient. And maybe what we need to do is to model gratitude. Eh? Model gratitude because we understand gratitude is a heart condition. Gratitude is a holy commitment. Gratitude is a human